Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Jack Thorne uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, he got his PhD in 2012 under the supervision of Richard Taylor and Dick Gross. Uh, he's a former Clay Research Fellow and was recently awarded a Whitehead, Whitehead Prize from the London Mathematical Society. And he works in algebraic number theory and representation theory. And today he'll talk about um, recent progress and potential automorphy. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to say thank you to my colleagues for their wonderful lectures. I've really enjoyed uh, all the lectures in this section. Um, so I want to talk today about some recent results in the Langlands program that have to do with uh, what some people call the reciprocity conjecture. So this is a conjecture that relates uh, Galois representations to representations of Galois groups of global fields on the one hand and uh, automorphic forms on the other, which are just functions which have uh, some kinds of symmetry and uh, an arithmetic group. Um, but since this lecture is not really aimed at uh, experts, since they already know everything that I have to say, I'm going to start at a little bit more basic level. So I want to start by trying to convince you that um, automorphic forms really are interesting if you want to study uh, things to do with the reciprocity and algebraic number theory. Um, so I'm going to start by asking if the clock is going to start, actually so that the clock is not working. <laughs> All right, let's carry on. Um, so I want to start by talking about quadratic uh, reciprocity. So very famous in number theory. Hopefully everyone here already knows a little bit about this. Uh, so let's just recall the notation. If you have an odd prime p, then the Legendre symbol uh, a mod p just tells you whether uh, a is either a square modulo p, in which case it's 1, or not a square, in which case it's minus 1. And the fundamental fact about uh, uh, Legendre symbols is the law of quadratic reciprocity uh, proved for the first time by Gauss in his Disquisitiones. Uh, and it says if you have two distinct odd primes P and Q, then you can compute the Legendre symbol of P mod Q in terms of the Legendre symbol of Q mod P very easily. And I'm going to show you a proof of this that uses the properties of uh, an automorphic form. And the proof is going to go through Gauss sums, which are another object that was introduced by Gauss in his Dis Disquisitiones. Um, and uh, here it is. It's the quadratic Gauss sum. So for any n, you have g of n. Uh, it's the sum of e to the 2 pi i a squared over n as a ranges over the residue classes modulo n. And there are various basic properties of these quadratic Gauss sums that are quite easy to establish. Um, the first one is that uh, they're related to quadratic reciprocity in an explicit way. So if P and Q are your uh, distinct odd primes, then that product of the genre symbols is given by that product or quotient of Gauss sums. And the second thing is that the square of the Gauss sum for prime modulus P is given by P up to a sign. So if P is 1 mod 4, it's plus P. And if P is 3 mod 4, then it's minus P. So this fixes the Gauss sum G of P itself up to sign. And if you can evaluate G of P explicitly, then that's one way to prove quadratic reciprocity. And Gauss was surely aware of this. As I said, he introduced the Gauss sums in his Disquisitiones, but he wasn't actually at that time able to evaluate uh, the sum exactly. That was something he was only able to do a few years later. So what we're really going to do is evaluate the Gauss sum after Cauchy using the properties of an automorphic form. And it's probably one of the most famous automorphic forms there is. It's this uh, theta function. Uh, it's the same theta function that was used by Riemann in his proof of the uh, continuation functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. So it's uh, defined for an argument tau, which is allowed to be any number in the complex upper half plane. And it's the sum e to the pi i n squared tau. That's a nice absolutely convergent sum. OK, so here's the strategy. There's only going to be one proof in my lecture today, and this is it. So please enjoy it. Uh, we, we look at the value of the theta function at uh, a particular point in the upper half plane. So we look at it at i epsilon plus 2 over p, where epsilon is a small positive real number. And if you just plug that into the definition, then you get the first line. And then if you tug out uh, n according to its regi residue class modulo p, then you see one term appearing. That's the e to the 2 pi i squared over p. It looks like what appears in the quadratic Gauss sum. And a second term, which looks like uh, a Riemann sum for the integral of e to the minus pi x squared. Or at least it does once you rescale by the length of the interval, which would be p times root epsilon in this case. So if you multiply by root epsilon and take the limit, then this is what you get. The Gauss sum times something that you understand. Now, why is that useful? Uh, well, as I said, this theta function is an automorphic form. That means that it has to satisfy um, 
some kind of invariance property under an arithmetic group, which would be, in this case, some kind of finite index subgroup of SL2Z. And the fundamental relation that you need to use is this one. So this is what happens to theta when you act on it by the Mobius transformation corresponding to the matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Um, so that's a relation, and if you just uh, evaluate this limit in a different way by first applying that relation and then doing the same trick with a series, then you very quickly find that the Gauss sum G of P is plus root P if P is 1 mod 4, and uh, I times root P if P is 3 mod 4. So that was what was conjectured by Gauss uh, at the time of the disquisitions, but only proved by him a few years later. And that's a proof of quadratic, re quadratic reciprocity. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about a generalization of this, and we're going to use this to motivate the introduction of the Adele ring. Okay, so what is the Adele ring? Well, it's an object that number theorists introduce in order to put all the different completions of the field of, of the rational numbers on an equal setting. Um, so there's one completion for every non-trivial absolute value. Uh, there's the usual real absolute value, and famously there's one piadic absolute value for every prime p. So that leads to this family of completions, the reals, and then the piadic rational numbers for every prime p. And the Adele ring is defined to be not quite the full direct product of all of the completions. It's a subring of the direct product called the restricted direct product. Um, and the reason that you pass that subring is because then you end up with something which is locally compact. So that's well adapted to doing Fourier analysis. And if you haven't seen this before, um, it's, it's really very nice. Uh, you can embed the rationals diagonally inside it. And that embedding of the rationals inside the Adele's is very closely analogous to uh, the usual embedding of the integers into the reals. So you get a discrete subring, which is co-compact. And the, def the uh, generalization of quadratic reciprocity that I want to show you is as follows. If you have any quadratic extension of the rationals, uh, you can define a homomorphism from the units in the Adele ring to plus or minus one. And it's, it's a product of uh, local homomorphisms, one for every completion, so in particular one for every prime p. And it's the local homomorphism nu e sub p that just tells you whether a given local unit is either a norm or not. So this new E sub P is something which is very closely analogous to the usual Lissandre symbol that we saw defined in the first slide. Then you define new E by taking the product uh, or all of these local things. And the theorem that you prove is that this global homomorphism from the units in the Adele to plus or minus one is trivial on um, the units in the rationals embedded diagonally. And this is indeed a generalization of quadratic reciprocity because if you specialize to E being the unique quadratic subfield of the piecyclic atomic field and use the fact that this homomorphism is trivial on the rational number Q, that, that just is quadratic reciprocity. And if you haven't seen that before, it's kind of a nice exercise to, to do the calculation and, and see how it comes out. So that this is a theorem that you can prove using theta functions in a way kind of generalizing what we've done already. And the ultimate generalization of this kind of statement, of course, is class field theory. So that describes not just quadratic extensions of Q, but all uh, Galois extensions with the Belian Galois group of all global fields. And a global field is just a number field, a finite extension of the rationals, or uh, a function field. So that would be a finite extension of FP, double brackets, T. And one formulation of class field theory is that whenever you have an abelian extension, you can represent it in a completely explicit way as a quotient of what we call the, the Adele class group. So you take the units in the Adele ring of K, which is defined for any global field in the same way as it is for the rationals. Um, and the, the Adele class group is units in AK modulo uh, diagonally embedded units in K. So class field theory is one of the greatest achievements, I think, of um, mathematics in the first half of the 20th century. But the natural question that comes afterwards is, well, if you can describe all abelian extensions of a global field, what about the non-abelian ones? Um, and well, this is more or less the content of the Langlands program. Um, and this is motivation for the Langlands program. The first thing you need to do in order to see your way to generalization is not to speak about uh, extensions of a field, but representations of the Galois group. So we're going to use this notation G sub K for the absolute Galois group of a global field and for other fields as well later. And we first reformulate class field theory as saying that there's a projection between, on the one hand, characters of the Gallo group and characters of the Adele class group. And that this leads us into this slide which states, or gives a, a statement of the reciprocity conjecture in the Langmans program. Um, so just one piece of notation, we're going to need to fix a prime L distinct from the characteristic of K for the remainder of this lecture. I, I, I won't dwell on that again. 
And we have this conjecture which incorporates ideas of Langlands, but also refinements due to Clausel and Fontaine and Maser as well. And it posits the existence of bijection between a class of Galois representations, so a class of irreducible and dimensional representations of the Galois group uh, on the one hand, and uh, of cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN of the Adels on the other. And if you haven't seen those before, we'll, we'll discuss them a little bit more in a couple of slides' time. On both sides of this slide, I've put the restriction algebraic. It's important to restrict the algebraic Galois representations and the algebraic automorphic representations, but it's, it's technical to describe what that condition is, so I'm not going to do so in my lecture today. Uh, just to convince you that this really is related to arithmetic, uh, here's what one consequence of the reciprocity conjecture would be. Um, so that's a description of elliptic curves over any global field uh, in terms of subclass of automorphic representations. Uh, and the, the reason that this is implied by the previous conjecture is because whenever you have an elliptic curve with scalar endomorphisms, you get an irreducible representation on the Tate module, which then determines the elliptic curve up to isogeny. And here's uh, a refinement of this, which is actually a theorem. This is what happens when k is equal to q, and it's basically the, uh, the shimura taniyama bay conjecture, um, proved uh, in the case of square-free n by Wiles, and for general n by Broy, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. Okay, so I promised I'd say a few words about what an automorphic form is. Um, well, I said, I, was, I, I said I'd say what an automorphic representation is. An automorphic representation is a representation of GLN of the Adels, that's a big locally compact group, which in occurs inside a certain space, and that space is the space of cuspidal automorphic forms. The, the key property that you need to know about an automorphic form is it's a function on GLN of the Adels, which is invariant under, under left translation by GLN of K, embedded diagonally. So that, that, that's the analog for GLN of the situation we had in class field theory, n equals one, where we want a, a function which uh, is just uh, on AK cross modular K cross. In, in general, you have something non-abelian, um, but you put this uh, invariance under left translation condition, and then you still have the right action of GLN of AK by right translation. So the left action of GLN of AK by right translation. Uh, and so that, that's why you get uh, representations. And uh, again, if you haven't seen these before, they are very closely related to classical objects. There's a very well understood relation between automorphic representations in general and, for example, classical holomorphic modular forms. And here's the recipe for example, for taking the Ramanujan and delta function, very famous holomorphic modular form, and using it to generate a cuspidal automorphic representation. So the, 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 this is uh, a theory which is meant to generalize the classical theory and, and also allow us to study it using representation theory. All right, so this is the bijection that the reciprocity conjecture is supposed to predict the existence of. But in order for the conjecture to have any content, we actually need to say a little bit more. Uh, we need to say, if you have a row on the Galois side and a pi on the automorphic side when you know that they correspond to each other. And this is something that you do using local information. So how do you get that local information? Well, by local I mean local at any place of your number field, and, or, or global field. And place is just another word for um, an equivalence class of uh, non-trivial absolute value. Or if you like, it's just a, a non-trivial completion. And on the automorphic side, we have a recipe for getting local data because just as GLN of the Adels factors as a restricted direct product of local groups, GLN of KV, the representation factors as a restricted tensor product. So that gives you these local factors, pi V, which are irreducible representations of the local group. On the Galois side, the fact that K embeds in KV, its completion, means you have uh, an embedding of Galois groups in the, other, in the other direction, an embedding of GKV into GK, which is then well, well determined up to conjugacy. And that means that if you have a global representation of rho, its restriction to the decomposition group, uh, GKV, is a representation which is uh, determined up to the choice of place V uh, up to isomorphism. And then uh, the matching is supposed to match up uh, the local L factors corresponding to uh, rho on the decomposition group and pi v the local factor, uh, the local uh, factor of the representation pi. And if rho and pi are matched in this way, then one particular co consequence is that the global L functions, which are defined to be the products of the local L factors, are also equal. And it's very important for theoretical and philosophical reasons that these conditions mean that if you have rho, then there's at most one pi that can correspond to it. And if you have pi, then there's at most one row that can correspond to it. So that means that this reciprocity bijection is unique if it exists. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk about 
uh, what we actually know about this reciprocity conjecture. And I'm going to start by talking about what we know, or some of what we know in the number field case, and then later on I'll move to some of what we know in the, in the case of a global field of positive characteristic. So in the number field case, we don't know that much, really, in general. Um, we really have to restrict to a certain class of number fields in order to be able to say anything non-trivial. Uh, and that class is uh, the class of number fields which are either totally real, so that means all of their embeddings in the complex numbers are actually taking values in the reals, or uh, a CM number field. So that means a totally complex quadratic extension of a totally real field. And if you haven't encountered these things before, then the most concrete examples are given by, uh, well, to get a totally real field, either take the rationals or a real quadratic field, and to, take a, to get a CM, fi CM field, take a imaginary quadratic field. Those are the perfect examples to bear in mind. So that's the first restriction I'm going to make. The second restriction I'm going to make is to not just algebraic objects, that's a condition that we've already imposed, although we haven't defined, but to regular algebraic ones. Okay, so on the Galois side, this means restricting to Galois representations which uh, don't have repeated Hodge Tate weights. Or if you're looking at Galois representations across one of motives, this means that all of the HPQs, all of the Hodge numbers, have to be either zero or one. Um, so elliptic curves are allowed. I've already said that uh, elliptic curves are something we understand very well. Um, but we wouldn't allow ourselves to take an abelian variety of dimension greater than one. And that's because if you have an abelian variety of dimension g, uh, the Tate module gives you a Galois representation of dimension 2g, and the, the non-zero Hodge numbers have multiplicity uh, g. So that wouldn't be regular. On the automorphic side, there's a condition which is supposed to match up with uh, the regular algebraic condition on the Galois side. And uh, well, it, it's described in terms of representation theory, but it, its real meaning for us is um, the fact that if you have a regular algebraic automorphic representation, it can be realized inside the, um, the cohomology of an arithmetic subgroup of GLN. So exactly the kind of cohomology groups which were discussed by Van Katesh in his plenary lecture. Um, the fact that you can do that is why we're actually able to, to say anything about them. Okay, so here's the first theorem uh, of my lecture. Uh, this is I think, a really amazing, exciting theorem. It took very many people decades to prove this theorem. And I think the, the first steps were taken in the 70s or maybe even earlier. Uh, and it says we know, once you've made these restrictions, a good chunk of the Langlands correspondence. We know how to go from the automorphic side to the Galois side. Or in other words, whenever I have a, an automorphic representation pi satisfying my conditions, I know how to find the corresponding Galois representation. And I just want to say a few words about the proof because it's quite interesting. Um, it's fairly easy to reduce to the case where the field is a CM field, so you make that reduction. And then the proof proceeds roughly in two stages. The, the, the first stage is looking at uh, automorphic representations which satisfy an additional so-called conjugate self-duality condition. So that means you're looking at cuspal automorphic representations of GLN which have the property that the dual, that's this uh, pi dual, is isomorphic to pi conjugate. So that means the image of pi under the involution of GLN via Dells, which is induced by complex conjugation acting on K. And the reason that this is a good class of representations to consider is because if you uh, are able to prove certain cases of Langlands functoriality, you can prove that any such automorphic representation descends to uh, a unity group. Or to put it in a slightly different language, you can find this pi, or at least something very closely related to pi, inside the cohomology of not an arithmetic group, subgroup of GLN, but an arithmetic subgroup of a unitary group. Um, and that puts you in the realm of Shamor varieties. And then you can hope to construct the Galois representations using the techniques of algebraic geometry, in particular using uh, a tal cohomology. So the, this is a kind of uh, a vague description of the proof, but actually carrying this out required a huge amount of mathematics. Um, there's the, the descent, so that means uh, proving cases of Lang Langlands functoriality, so that means uh, getting a very good understanding of the trace formula, proving the fund fundamental lemma. Um, stabilizing the trace formula. So there's a lot of work to be done on the representation theory side. And then on the side of actually understanding the Shamor varieties, you have to be able to uh, construct integral models. Um, there, there, there's an awful lot that needs to be done. And this part of the proof was finished in about 2012, I'd say. Then there's the second step of the proof, and that's when you no longer put this conjugate self-duality condition. And the, the strategy is to try to reduce to the first case 
Uh, and you basically start off with your pi, which is no longer conjugate self-dual, and try and make it conjugate self-dual in the most naive possible way. So you just uh, sum it up with pi conjugate dual, and then you parabolically induce that to get an automorphic representation of GL2n. So something which is no longer cuspidal, but which is, which is at least going to be conjugate self-dual. And then you try and find congruences between that representation and um, one which is both conjugate self-dual and cuspidal, because then you've already constructed the Galois representations in the, the, the first stage of the proof. Um, and then if you can make enough congruences, then there's a kind of limiting argument to reconstruct the Galois representation. Um, so the, the, that's somehow easy once you know how to construct congruences. And two proofs to date have been given, two uh, unconditional instances of this strategy. Um, the first one was uh, due to Michael Harris, Carmen Land, Richard Taylor, and myself. And we carried out the strategy using overconvergent modular forms, so a kind of relatively classical uh, style of argument, at least in the context of this kind of algebraic number theory. And shortly after that, the second proof was given by uh, Peter Schultzer, using many of the te techniques that he alluded to in his plenary lecture, so using in particular the Hodge-Tate period map, uh, which is defined on the perfect hodge more variety infinite level. And of course, he was able to go much further. He proved not just this, but also the existence of Galois representations attached to torsion classes in, uh, in curve homology. So that, that was something very exciting. Okay. So once you have one direction of the reciprocity conjecture, the ability to go from the automorphic side to the Galois side, the next step is to say, well, what about the other direction? Or in other words, is this map from the left to the right actually subjective? And it's useful to introduce some language in order to study that problem. We say that a Galois representation is automorphic if it happens to be in the image. And what can we prove about this? Well, in the first uh, interesting case for the study of this question, so that's when k is equal to q and n is equal to 2, uh, we actually know an awful lot. And we're, we're quite close to being able to prove that this map is bijective. Um, and that's because we have, on the one hand, the proof of Serre's conjecture by Kai and Vantabage. And on the, other, on the other hand, extremely powerful modularity lifting theorems, which are proved by Emmett and Nikizen using um, the existence of the Piatic flux Langlois correspondence for GL2QP. So that, that's amazing work, but unfortunately, those ingredients we just don't have access to in the more general context of a general CM field uh, or an integer n greater than 2. So if you want to prove unconditional theorems, you need to do something slightly different, uh, and that motivates the notion of potential automorphy. Okay, so what is potential automorphy? We've just said what it means for a Galois representation to be automorphic. We say that it's potentially automorphic if you can find some uh, extension L over, L over K of your base field, such that the restriction of your Galois representation to the Galois group of that field, so that'll be a finite index subgroup of the, of the Galois group of GK, uh, is itself automorphic. So it means rho does play a role in the Langlands correspondence, but only after possibly making some base change, which you may not be able to have a lot of control over in general. And one reason why this um, definition is interesting is it provides evidence for uh, the reciprocity conjecture. Another reason why it's interesting is because if you know that a Galois representation, especially of the Galois group of a number field, is uh, potentially automorphic, you can prove many things about it. So it's maybe quite well known that if you can prove that the Galois representation is automorphic, uh, its L function can be proved to have an analytic continuation and satisfy a functional equation. Um, but those properties can actually be proved to hold for um, potentially automorphic Galois representations as well. And that's a, a, a kind of group theoretic argument due to Taylor that uses uh, the fact that you know solvable base change for automorphic representations of GLN. Um, and I, in fact, I think the possibility of doing that is one of the reasons why Taylor was interested in potential automorphy in the first place. And for Galois representations which fall inside that kind of Schmoor variety conjugate self dual context, we have extremely powerful potential automorphy theorems, which um, kind of start with the first theorems that Taylor proved maybe 15 years ago, but go much, much further. And here's an example of a theorem due to Pratikas and Taylor. And it's, it says, more or less, if you have a compatible system of regular algebraic conjugate self dual Galois representations, which satisfies a purity condition, which always will if it comes from algebraic geometry, then it's potentially automorphic. So this is really very strong evidence for the reciprocity conjecture, at least for uh, regular algebraic Galois representations. Okay, so uh, how do you prove potential automorphy theorem? Well, there's, there's a kind of template for the proof that goes back to the original work of Taylor that I just mentioned. And there are three main ingredients, which I'll describe in this slide. 
Um, so let, let's go through them in turn. The first one is you need to have access to automorphy lifting theorems. So the, 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 these are the only kinds of results that we know that allow us to prove Galois representations are automorphic. And the rough idea is if I have two Galois representations uh, and I know one of them is automorphic, then I might be able to propagate that property to the second one. And often it is possible to do that as long as you have uh, a congruence modulo L. So if I have two representations of GL and ZL, take ZL coefficients just for simplicity, if the reductions modulo L of those representations is the same, I can hope to carry out that propagation. And in general, that's possible only if you put many other technical conditions, but th th that's the idea. The second thing you need is, and this is language that was introduced by Marco Harris that I quite like, you need to have a class of universally automorphic Galois representations. So th these are representations which are automorphic after an arbitrary base change. And then the third ingredient, which I, I can't really state precisely in general, is access to good moduli spaces of motives with fixed residual Galois representation. So rather than trying to say exactly what this means, let me just give you an example. So this is kind of a prototypical argument to prove potential automorphy of elliptic curves. Um, so you start with elliptic curve E that you want to prove is potentially automorphic in this sense. Uh, and you need to fix some extra data to make the proof work. So you need to fix two primes, P and L, distinct. And you need to prove, sorry, and you need to choose uh, another elliptic curve A over K with complex multiplication. And the moduli space of motives that you introduce in this case is very simple. It's just the modular curve which classifies uh, elliptic curve C, which come equipped with an isomorphism between the L torsion on C and the L torsion on E, and the P torsion on C and the P torsion on A. Now, you don't know anything about this uh, modular curve except for the fact that it's a curve. Um, but being a curve, that means it does have rational points of not over K, at least over some finite extension L over K. So you choose such an L, you choose a rational point that corresponds to a curve C, which comes equipped with this extra data. Uh, and then you, you use the fact that elliptic curves with complex multiplication are universally automorphic. So that allows you to propagate the property of automorphy, first of all, from A to C, using uh, an automorphy lifting theorem at the prime P, and then from C to E, using the automorphy lifting theorem at the prime L. Okay, so that, that, that's a very rough sketch of the argument, and to make it work, you usually need to impose many more technical conditions, but the, the, that's, that's the basic idea. And, okay, so here's a theorem, which uh, Schultz already mentioned in his plenary lecture, um, but this is uh, the potential automorphy of elliptic curves defined over CM fields, uh, and it uses the fact that um, we now have access to these Galois representations attached to uh, both non-self-dual automorphic forms on GL2 and also torsion classes so, uh, inside the cohomology of arithmetic subgroups of GL2 of a CM field. Um, and we have other theorems as well. I, I, should I should say that one of the main ingredients that we need in order to make this work is um, a form of local global compatibility for those Galois representations. So we have to be able to prove that they satisfy the conditions in Piatic Hodge theory that we, one would expect them to satisfy. Um, so for those of you who know something to do with uh, Wiles proof of Fermat, for example, you have to prove that the Galois representations might be finite flat for the sake of argument. Um, and that's one of the things that's accomplished in this 10-author project, and which in turn depends in an essential way on uh, another joint project that uh, Peter Schultz mentioned in his plenary lecture with Anna Karyani about the vanishing of cohomology of Schmoll varieties. Um, one other thing that I'd, I'd like to mention is uh, another work in progress, which is um, kind of trying to take this a little bit further. And this is a, a joint project between uh, Patrick Allen, Shekhar and myself, where we're trying to remove the word potentially. So we, we re re really want to try and prove modularity of elliptic curves over CM fields. And uh, at the moment, we can prove, um, uh, let's say, if you look at the, the J invariant of an elliptic curve over a CM field, then as long as you put some local conditions on the J invariant of finitely many primes, then your elliptic curve will be modular. Um, so, for example, a positive proportion of elliptic curves over any CM field are modular or automorphic in this sense. Um, ideally, one would like to go a little bit further and perhaps aim for something like modularity of elliptic curves over imaginary quadratic fields, but I think that's probably still some, some distance away. But we're, we're taking the first steps in order to be able to do that. Right, so th th that's um, some recent work which has taken place over number fields. Now I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk about some theorems which have been proved in the context of global fields of uh, positive characteristic. Okay, so here's the slide. Now here the landscape is strikingly different um, because, 
well, at, at first glance, we know everything that we could possibly want to know. In particular, we know the reciprocity conjecture as I stated it on uh, a slide in the, in the first part of this talk. And well, we know it because Laurent Lefort proved it around the year 2000 and received the Fields Medal for his work in 2002. Um, so he proved that um, there really is a bijection between cusp forms on the one hand and irreducible representations of the Galois group on the other provided you impose these algebraicity conditions, which are actually very weak in the function field context. And he, he proved not only this, but that this correspondence satisfies every property that you could reasonably ask of it. So it's not only compatible with local L factors, it's also compatible with the local Langlands correspondence. It's also compatible with epsilon factors. Um, so everything, basically. And the reason that he was able to do that, well. One of the reasons is that there are many tools that are available to you in the function field context that aren't available in uh, the context of number fields, at least at the moment. And what, one of the most significant is if you have, um, let's say, an, an irreducible algebraic representation of the Galois group of your global field K, K of positive characteristic, well, K can be realized as the function field of um, a smooth curve of FP. Let's say smooth projective. And you can always spread out your Galois representation to a local system on that smooth curve, not necessarily on the projective one, but at least on a smooth curve. And once you do that, you have access to Grodendieck's theory of a tall cohomology. So you can compute the L function, for example, in terms of um, uh, the tall cohomology of your uh, Galois representation rho using the left trace formula. So that, that's a really powerful tool because one way to try to prove that a given Galois representation rho is automorphic is by trying to get a handle on uh, the various L functions that are, that are associated to it. OK, so you might say there's nothing to be done. That's the end of the story. But of course, that's, that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because if you're looking only at automorphic forms on GLN and n-dimensional Galois representations, you're really only seeing a very small part of the original vision of Langlands. So Langland says that you should consider automorphic representations on all groups, all reductive groups, G, not just GLN, because if you don't do that, then you're failing to see uh, a, a huge number of symmetries that might be there in the world of automorphic forms, albeit difficult to detect, and therefore on the side of Galois representations and, and motives as well. So there should be a reciprocity conjecture, not just for GLN, but for any reductive group G. Um, and I'm going to talk about, well, let's say, a special case of that. Um, so just for simplicity, I want to fix G here to be a, a split reductive group over FP. Um, so you can take, if you like, G to be a split classical group, like SLN or SP2N or SON. Uh, or you could take G to be an exceptional group. So that would be, well, any of the exceptional groups, but G2, F4, E8 are perfectly good examples. Um, in fact, for what I'm going to talk about, um, the exceptional groups are probably the most interesting ones because there are other ways that we have to study automorphic representations of classical groups using um, known cases of functoriality. Okay, so the, the, the one extra thing you need to know in order, in order to be able to understand the reciprocity conjecture is that associated to any reductive group like this is the so-called Langlands dual group, which I've denoted here uh, LG, and which you should think of as being, at least for us, as a, a reductive group over Q and even split. And this is associated to the original group G using a simple combinatorial recipe, which relies upon the classification theory of reductive groups. And um, the, as long as you know a little bit about the theory of reductive groups, it's very easy to write down what it is in any, in any given case. Um, so I've got two examples on this slide. If G is SLN, then the dual group is PGLN. Well, of, course, of course, the first SLN is over FP, and the second one is over um, Q. Conversely, the, the dual of PGLN over FP is SLN over Q, and the dual of E8 would just be E8. So that, that, that's a, a nice exceptional example. All right, so in this case, what would the reciprocity conjecture say? Well, I've been a bit mealy-mouthed here. I've just said you expect a correspondence between automorphic representations, which are defined in the same way for, for G as they would be for GLN, uh, and representations of the Galois group into the dual group on the other side. Now, I haven't att attempted to state here a precise conjecture because actually stating something precise is much more difficult in um, uh, the case of a general group G. And there are various reasons for that. Uh, one is that you need to formulate what 
for example, the analog of irreducible should be on the Galois side, um, and then you need to find the automorphic analog of that. It's certainly not going to be cuspidal in general. Um, and then you have, for example, the phenomenon of L indistinguishability. There are different automorphic representations which should correspond to the same row, um, and various other, uh, other issues that may arise as well. And I've discussed a few of those in um, my article for these proceedings. Okay, so what do we know about this? Well, we're very fortunate that uh, in recent work, uh, Vincent Lefort has constructed the automorphic to Galois direction of this correspondence for any reductive group G over, over a finite field. Um, so we're kind of in as good a situation for uh, this situation as we are for uh, regular algebraic forms over, over number fields. By the way, I think this is really uh, one of the most exciting things to happen in number theory for a very long time. Um, so I really strongly urge you all to go to his plenary lecture on Wednesday. It is when, Thursday, Thursday. Okay, anyway, once you have access to one direction of the correspondence, the natural question is, can you go back in the opposite direction? So can you do in this situation of a global field of positive characteristic what we were doing in the number field case? And the answer is yes. Um, so here's uh, one theorem that uh, we have proved. So that this is a joint work between Gebhard Berkler, Michael Harris, Shekhar and myself. And we say, suppose G is a split, a uh, simple or semi-simple uh, reductive group over FP, and take rho to be a representation of the Galois group into the dual group, which has two uh, key assumptions. Uh, the first one is that it's everywhere and ramified. So that means it actually does come from a representation of the Atal fundamental group of the, the smooth projective curve. Uh, and secondly, that the representation has the risky dense image in the dual group. So, uh, for example, if I'm looking at uh, G equals E8, I really want this risky closure of the image in the dual group E8 of QL bar to be E8. So that, that, that's quite a strong condition. Um, then what we deduce is that rho is potentially automorphic. So after passing to a finite index subgroup of the Galois group, you can find an automorphic representation on um, uh, the corresponding global field, which corresponds to, um, corresponds to the restriction of rho. And I'd just like to say a few words about the proof of this theorem, because I think it, it's quite nice. Um, the, the prototype that I described for elliptic curves, I'm, it does eventually work in the setting, but the, the issue is that there are a lot of things you have to generalize for which it's not so obvious how to generalize them. And probably the most interesting part of the proof is discovering a class of universally automorphic Galois representations. So when you're working with the GLN, there's a very good source of these because we know automorphic induction as a consequence of um, the work of Arthur and Clausel on the, the twisted trace formula for GLN. Um, but for general reductive group G, we don't have access to anything like that. And especially for automorphic representations of E8, say it's extremely hard to um, prove anything about them. And we certainly don't have anything like strong multiplicity one, which is a really essential tool for understanding what happens for GLN. So we have to look somewhere different. We want to have access to some kind of known case of functoriality. And in order to be able to do that, we restrict to a particular class of Galois parameters. Um, and to describe those, I just want to introduce a little bit more notation. Um, so I said I was going to look at every unramified Galois representations. So those should come from uh, a representation of the Atal fundamental group with a smooth projective curve X. And for any such x, you have an exact sequence of fundamental groups like the one on this slide. So the sub is the geometric part of the fundamental group. So that's the fundamental group of x base change to the algebraic closure of your finite field. And then the quotient group would be, well, you can either think of it as pi 1 of um, the spectrum of your finite field, or you can think of it as being just the absolute Galois group of the finite field. Of course, they're the same. And the kinds of parameters uh, that we're going to look at, the kinds of representations that are going to be universally automorphic are going to satisfy these two key conditions. Uh, the first one is that the image of the geometric part of the fundamental group should be contained in a maximal torus of the dual group, and it should be a unique maximal torus. So you somehow want to be in a maximal torus and regular there. And the second condition is that when you look at the induced action of um, the, uh, the Galois part of the fundamental group on that torus, or on the character group of the torus, you want that to be through an elliptic element of, of the vial group. And the reason why these restrictions are, are useful is that uh, if the image is contained inside a torus, that means it should correspond to Eisenstein series. Um, but if the extension from the geometric part of the fundamental group to the entire fundamental group has a property that you're seeing this elliptic action, 
um, then that means the representation of the full fundamental group should correspond to uh, a tempered cusp form for the sake of argument. And uh, the key input that we use is actually some input from the geometric Langlands program. So this is an example of an application of the geometric Langlands program to the arithmetic Langlands program. And uh, what we're using is the fact that Braverman and Gatesbury uh, around the year 2000 constructed the categorification of classical Eisenstein series. So they constructed the, the Hecker eigensheaf on Bun G, uh, which it should be associated to a Gala parameter which takes values in uh, a torus in the dual group. And because they have that geometric object, um, it's a natural construction, it comes equipped with a Vey descent datum which describes the extension from the geometric part of the fundamental group to the entire, fun part, the entire fundamental group. That allows you to descend this Hecker eigensheaf from Bungie over the algebraic closure to the whole of Bungie, and then taking trace of Frobenius uh, gives you an explicit, explicit automorphic form, which is the one you're looking for in order to prove um, universal automorphy. So it's kind of a known case of functoriality, which is very convenient for our intended application. And then there's this kind of very lucky miracle that um, these, this very limited class of parameters that we have access to, if we put one extra condition on them, which is that the induced action of Frobenius on the torus is not just through an elliptic element, but through a Coxter element of the vial group, so that's somehow the best regular elliptic element there is, then the Galois parameter is robust enough to be used as input into our automorphic lifting theorems. Um, so there's this one class of parameters that, on the one hand, we can prove to be universally automorphic, and on the other hand, is um, suitable for, for use in our, our automorphic lifting theorem. Um, so if you like reductive groups, this is, this is quite nice, I think. Okay, so I'd just like to leave you with this corollary, which is um, somehow an easy special case of our theorem, but I think it's a, a nice uh, indication of how we think about these things. So it says simply that uh, you can find infinitely many pairs uh, x comma pi, where x is a smooth projective curve over fp, and we write k for its function field, and pi is a cuspidal, everywhere unramified automorphic representation of uh, E8 of uh, the Adels of k, such that the associated Galois representation, which we know exists thanks to the work of Van Sander Fogg, has the risky dense image in the dual group. And I really don't know any way to construct examples like this except using, using our techniques. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? No questions? All right. Um, Let's thank Jack again and, and meet the, in 15 minutes. So.